The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on strengthening indigenous communities through cultural and environmental protection preservation. Under committee rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chair and the ranking minority member. This will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and help members keep to their schedules. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. Hearing no objections, so ordered. Without objection, the chair may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. Hearing no objections, so ordered. As described in the hearing notice, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at hnrcdocs at mail.house.gov. Additionally, please note that as with in-person meetings, members are responsible for their own microphones. As with our in-person meetings, members can be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical problems should inform committee staff immediately. I will begin by recognizing myself for my opening statement. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the subcommittee's hearing on strengthening indigenous communities through cultural and environmental preservation. Before we hear about various indigenous cultural and environmental preservation initiatives, it is important to remind ourselves about our country's sad history on this topic. Over the centuries, the federal government enacted cultural and physical violence policies aimed and directed against American Indian and Alaska Native communities. Examples of these harmful policies include creating Indian boarding schools and the dissolution of tribal governments and lands during the termination era. Many indigenous peoples were threatened and generations of tribal cultures were prevented from engaging in traditional religions. The official policies also tried to stamp out their languages. Language is key to maintaining a worldview and a culture. I am deeply committed to cultural and language preservation. In 1973, my parents helped Biden pass New Mexico's Bilingual Multicultural Education Act which required that Terra Tiwa, Toa, Zuni, Karazin, Navajo, Apache, and Spanish be taught in schools. More than four decades later, the court in the Yazi Martinez case found that Native American other dual language students were still not receiving an adequate education in violation of New Mexico's constitution and the uh, Education Act I described earlier. This long you know, these four decades, even after the law was passed, exemplifies how tribes must be vigilant and persistent in promoting cultural and language preservation and how governments, both state and federal, must rise to meet its trust obligation. Indigenous communities continue to feel the effects of our government's past outright attack on their very existence, and they suffer today from cultural loss and intergenerational trauma. To counterbalance this assault, many tribal governments and organizations have dedicated resources for cultural preservation efforts to ensure future generations have access to their culture. As we will hear, cultural preservation often goes hand in hand with environmental preservation. As we've repeatedly heard in this committee, indigenous wisdom can help guide our response to today's environmental crises. The tribal leaders and organizers before us today are making strides in their communities to protect the environment while preserving cultural traditions for future generations. Many traditional teachings and life ways strengthen not only the community, but the environment around it. Often, traditional teachings are passed along from generation to generation, season after season. Overall, these initiatives seek to protect and sustain community history and cultures. Tribal-led initiatives also benefit from exercising tribal self-determination by providing new opportunities for education and economic development among communities. Put simply, cultural preservation strengthens each distinct tribal community and remains an essential topic for our subcommittee. Today's hearing will allow us to consider how we can support community-led tribal cultural preservation efforts currently underway and ensure that indigenous communities have federal resources to promote cultural longevity with environmental protections. I appreciate today's opportunity to hear our witnesses' stories and hope we can all learn from their wealth of knowledge. I'll also be asking them 
what changes do we need to make at the federal level to support their efforts, to protect their cultural traditions and their environment? I now recognize ranking member Don Young for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, for having this hearing. Uh, this is a very important hearing. When a light of time, I'm going to ask unanimous consent to revive and extend and submit my opening statement to the record. But I'd like to cover, without objection, well, <laughs> well I'd like to cover the one act of which I was deeply involved in is the 2004 Tribal Forest Protection Act. Uh, this is very, very important because we're talking about the environment and we're allowing tribes to enter into agreements with Secretary of Agriculture and Interior to perform forest management. We've heard a lot about forest fires, et cetera. Now you check it, most of the lands that have been managed by the tribes and forestry have done an excellent job. Uh, I don't think our Forest Service has. I would write up from it and from certain preservationist groups, they have not looked upon the, the idea of having a renewable resource protected and provided for. The tribes have, and I'm very excited about that. Hopefully in the testimony from the witnesses, we'll see where we can improve this act. Because one of the things that I've been challenged with, Madam Chair, is we, we, we pass acts to let the tribes do things, and yet other parts of the federal government say you can't. And uh, it's like, you know, we have certain forests in certain areas where the national forest butts up right against it, and they've managed their forests, the tribes have managed it well, and all of a sudden the bugs get into the national forest or there's a forest fire and it gets over into the native tribe lands and the forest service. We have to look at this. You know, I've even suggested there ought to be a big buffer zone between the two on the forest service line side, because this is not fair for giving them under the 2004 act, the opportunity to manage timber and then have it sort of offset by the lack of management by the forest service. So this is a very important program. We have that type program in, in Alaska. It's a, um, I'm going to pronounce this Chugamuk Mute uh, as an Alaska Native nonprofit. It's, it's a Chugiak tri, uh, forest. They've done real well. We've had a problem up there with spark, Bruce Park beetles and uh, such. That we're working together with the Forest Service, yes, but that, that tribe is doing well and protecting their lands that we provided to them through the Native Land Claims Act and actually providing for a new forest system. So I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to go forth with this. We can go in further depth. And with that, Madam Chair, I'll give back the balance of my time. Thank you so very much, uh, Ranking uh, Member Young. Uh, I also would note that uh, the chair of the full committee is with us today, Chairman Grijalva, and we will hear from him later today during questioning. Um, uh, I, now I'd like to transition to our panel of witnesses for today. Before introducing them, I will remind our witnesses uh, that uh, they are encouraged to participate in the Witness Diversity Survey created by the Congressional Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Witnesses may refer uh, to my, my. their hearing invitation materials for further information. Under our committee rules, oral statements are limited to five minutes, but you may submit longer written statement for the record if you choose. When you begin, the on-screen timer will begin counting down and it will turn orange when you have one minute remaining. I recommend that members and witnesses joining remotely use the grid view so they, they may lock the timer on the screen. When you go over the lot of time, I will gently ask you to wrap up your statement. After your testimony is complete, please remember to mute yourself to avoid any inadvertent background noise. I will allow the entire panel to testify before we question the witnesses. The chair now recognizes the Honorable Chairman Fairbanks, who is chairman of the White Earth Nation. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Fernandez, Ranking Member Young, of the committee. On behalf of the White Earth Ojibwe, I'm grateful, grateful for this opportunity to share, share with our concern our environmental justice in Indian country. My name is Michael Fairbanks. I am a elected tribal chairman of the White Earth Band of Ojibwe. I want to focus my testimony on the issues surrounding the federal government authorizing and recently completed Enbridge Line 3 replacement project through our treaty territory as well as water protection of our people. The White Earth Ban opposes the construction through our treaty territory since the route was 
proposed by Enbridge in 2015. The new route crossed our territory. We ceded in the Treaty of 1985, also known as the Treaty of Washington. The new route also directs the waters of the Mississippi through the watershed of our people that used intermittently for fishing and ricing. Throughout the permitting process, our police and federal regulars fell on deaf ears. The Minnesota Public Utility Commission approved Embers of need and route permit despite our objections treating us like, like some other party co-regulating of natural resources. Our status as a sovereign nation depends. The Army Corps of Engineers approved Enbridge permit application without its own environmental impacts. The Army Corps also did not comply with its own requirements and rushed its group and its permit through the little public input in November of 2020 as the COVID-19 pandemic ran the nation. Despite our wires never stopped pleading to the state and federal officials to create the to construction. In June of 2021, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources issued a DY permit amendment that allowed Enbridge to displace almost five gallons of water, of groundwater. This amendment was issued with no meaning tribal consultation, even more amendment to displace billions of was granted through a severe drought. Discussion with the Army Corps finally began to take place in 2021, and the White Earth could request the Army Corps to the temporary suspend the due both lead to procedural irregularities and the lack of tribal consultation and input during the initial approval. Sustainable irregularities. Significant cultural sites located along the construction route and stop ignored. However, no temporary suspension was ever granted. As a result of our efforts, White Earth is now crude oil pipeline pumping 700,000 barrels of sands oil homelands and the Mississippi headwaters. Now that construction is complete, our natural resources has a Enbridge piece that pierced the ground for during its construction result of 2.4 million gallons Water. The Minnesota Department of Natural Enbridge failed to notify the of its violation and merely the multi billion dollar conglomerate million dollars for its significant loss of our group. The water story is not unique in Indian country. It's people standing for the environment and stewardship of our natural are routinely ignored and sidelined. Three of ignoring tribal governments honestly expect more from our state of Minnesota, from our Army Corps of Engineers. It's my sincere hope that we can shed on these repeated abuse and to require tribal projects approaching on our tribal homelands. Thank you for your time today. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Miigwech. Thank you very much, Chairman, for your testimony. Uh, the Chair now recognizes Mr. Maroto, who is Division Administrator for the Treaty Natural Resources Division for the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior, Chippewa. Uh, my name is Chase Marano, and I'm the Treaty Natural Resources Division Administrator for the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior, Chippewa. Uh, thank you, Chair Fernandez and Ranking Member Young for this opportunity to speak today at the Strengthening Indigenous Communities Through Cultural Environmental Preservation Hearing. The Red Cliff Band is de dedicated to the preservation, protection, and sustainable management of the tribes in Inuimagan, uh, which also means relatives, who are often called natural resources. Doing so creates a balance between a healthy environment, economic goals, and future subsistence of all tribal members. This ensures that our future generations continue to enjoy benefits 
of the places that they hold significant historical, cultural, and environmental importance. The Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians mission is to promote, plan, and provide for the health, welfare, education, environmental protection, cultural preservation, and economic well-being of all tribal members and to protect treaty rights now and in the future. By tradition, the Anishinaabe are hunter-gatherers, and we believe that there's a responsibility to our relatives to protect them for the next seven generations and beyond. Redcliffe must be mindful of threats and counter them through investigation and restorative practices. These risks range from invasive species to the ever-warming climate and to the contamination of the natural world. With these constant, with these constant threats to our relatives, Redcliffe remains committed to protecting Nibi, which means water, Aki, which means land, and air of our current and ancestral homelands for our people and generations to come. To address these threats, tribal employees work closely within the tribal government structure to represent those relatives who cannot speak for themselves. The continuous monitoring, knowledge sharing, and in many other ways, the tribe continually strives to ensure that our relatives will be protected. To protect our relatives, we must protect our shared environment. This means preserving our treaty rights and our traditional ways. Red Cliff is and has always been a fishing tribe. Our reservation was selected because of its location on Lake Superior and the close proximity to historical fishing grounds. Fishing Lake Superior has been a tradition passed down from generation to generation that is still growing strong. Elders have passed on this way of life and the knowledge of the Great Lake Superior to sons and daughters alike. Currently, the Red Cliff Tribe has 14 licensed big boaters and 20 licensed small boaters who all hold commercial fishing licenses. Commercial fishing on Lake Superior provides a Red Cliff food sovereignty and a means of living for many Red Cliff families. Not only do the licensed fishers benefit from fishing, but many other community members are involved in fishing practices as well. They hold jobs as deckhands, processors, and distributors. In 2018, the Red the Red Cliff Tribe was awarded a settlement settlement from the Keep Siegel court case to build a 3,200 square foot food processing facility and develop value added products such as frozen fish, smoked fish products, and caviar. This facility is now known as the Red Cliff Fish Company. In the past, the local fish market was monopolized by one non native off reservation buyer who controlled the local market and prices for over 60 years. However, with the opening of the Red Cliff Fish Company, there is now local competition for that fish market. An administration for Native Americans grant assisted in the opening of the Red Cliff Fish Company, which opened its doors in the fall of 2020 and has been purchasing local fish ever since. Red Cliff has faced many great challenges over time, and most recently, one of those challenges is the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has been a different kind of threat, but has presented many challenges to the Red Cliff Nation. During this time, the Red Cliff community called, on, called upon its relatives for help. The Red Cliff Fish Company and tribal fishers collaborated with many other tribal programs to provide, provide food for our community. Fresh frozen, fresh fish, frozen fish, and smoked fish were all distributed throughout the community at different times to help with feeding local families. During the pandemic, our land has been seen as an oasis for families. <clears throat> Excuse me. With no social gatherings, many turned to areas such as Frog Bay Tribal National Park for outdoor activities in which they were able to stay happy and healthy. It is in these times of trouble that we can come together and take care of each other. The relatives of the Anishinaabe are vital to the way of life here in Redcliffe. The federal government has a trust obligation to provide for the tribes. Failure to provide for our relatives not only violates this trust responsibility, but it also renders treaty guaranteed rights to hunt and fish and gather on ceded lands meaningless. We are asking that you fulfill your trust responsibility to the tribes and uphold our treaty guarantees for, by providing sufficient funding and support to further monitor, research, and help protect our relatives. With which for your time and consideration. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Miroto. The chair now recognizes Ms. Azuz, who is the secretary for the Cultural Fire Management Council for five minutes. Good morning. I'm honored to be here, um, honorable chair and ranking member Young. 
Um, I'd like to speak about the importance of fire. So we put fire on the ground as indigenous people, and we know what it takes to live with the earth and how to restore our homelands, our rivers, our food, and our medicines. We're taught from a very early age what is required of us as human beings and where we fit in the greater scheme of life. We follow directives given to us by our elders and our, the creator. None of us is greater than the whole. The earth requires us all to do our part. As indigenous people, we have responsibilities to care for all beings, the trees, the water, animals, all of which cannot speak for themselves. And allowing tribes to restore their homelands with fire, the greatest tool left to us by the creator, we will ensure that future generations have clean water, healthy food and medicines, which has sustained us since the beginning of time. Cultural Fire Management Council has been working with CAL FIRE, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, U.S. Forest Service, and the Yurok Tribe, as well as local and state air quality agencies to continue our work in our ancestral territories. The permitting policies are a necessary part of ensuring we have all the documents and permits in place to safely burn with all necessary resources to ensure the community safety. Allowing indigenous fire practitioners to assist our governing bodies to help clean 100 years of fire suppression debris will help us to slow and eventually rid the earth of wildfire disasters. We partner with the Nature Conservancy, the Fire Learning Network, and the Indigenous Peoples Burning Network. With all of that said, you know, we look to our seven generations past to guide our seven generations into the future. We actively work with many government agencies that um, would normally be in the way of our way of life. They would try to stop what we do, um, thinking that natives don't know how to care for the land. It's completely wrong. You know, we live on the land, we hunt, we gather, we fish. Uh, we provide for our elders, we provide for our children, and many of these things that we do as tribal members allows for our elders to maintain the foods that they have known their entire lives. Uh, to gather from the, the land is something, you know, that our women uh, revere. Our basket weavers are some of the most beautiful weavers in the world. And it's amazing for me to be able to walk out into the land, to put prescribed fire on the land and restore our hazel and our bear grass and our serotonous plants that require fire to be usable. There are so many things that we do as Cultural Fire Management Council when we put on a training exchange. We bring participants from all over the world. Our last training had uh, participants from Spain and Ecuador. We had media from France and England. You know, it, it's just really wonderful to be able to bring these people together to show them what it's like as indigenous people to care for the land and then to have them go back to their home countries and put prescribed fire on the ground to meet with their indigenous peoples and to bring that right back to them. Uh, we're blessed to have close to a million dollar grant with Cal Fire to work in our reservation and our ancestral territory. We will be restoring close to, um, in our lifetime, it will take 40,000 hectares. And so, you know, it, it's wonderful to be able to be here and present to you and to explain what is necessary for us as indigenous people to have these means, to be able to be supported by the government, to be heard by the government. Um, this hasn't always been the case as indigenous people. I'm the first generation of my family not to be sent to a boarding school. So I'm honored to be able to sit here and talk with you and to explain, you know, what it's like to bring our children from our schools, from the early preschool on into high school and teach them about prescribed burning, teach them how important it is to be a caretaker of the land and to see the light in their eyes when they realize that their elders and their community members are the ones that are providing the food for them and their elders. Um, we still have our ceremonial dances here. We're able to provide food for them, the native foods that are so important to our people. You know, in any other situation, we would not be able to do this because we have been so restricted. But in the Yurok Reservation, you know, we have been able to work with our own tribe as a nonprofit. We've been able to help people increase their burning qualifications, to receive the qualifications they need to work within the NWCG system and to be able to take this knowledge across the country. 
Uh, we also have an Indigenous Peoples Burning Network where we reach out to tribes across the country and we work with them to bring their burning rights back, teach them to meet with their elders and hear the stories and know their fire history. This is all things that, you know, wouldn't be possible just a few hundred years, you know, past. So thank you so much, Honorable Chair and uh, Representative Young. I'm blessed to be here and look forward to answering any questions. Bwishja. Thank you so much, Mr. Zeus, uh, for your testimony. The chair will now recognize our final witness, Mr. Dusatel, who is president of the Intertribal Timber Council. Mr. Dusatel, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to start by thanking the committee for asking the Intertribal Timber Council to provide input on how tribes address environmental protection in our forest management. The ITC was established in 1976 as a nonprofit nationwide consortium of Indian tribes, Alaska Native corporations, and individuals dedicated to improving the management of natural resources for Native American communities. A total of 334 reservations in 36 states, 18.6 million acres of forest and woodlands are held in trust by the United States and managed for the benefit of Indian people. Pursuant to both tribal direction and federal law, our forests must be sustainably managed. Tribal forests must meet and often exceed the same goals as other federal lands, while subject to the same federal regulations such as the National Environmental Policy Act and Endangered Species Act. In spite of these regulatory challenges, tribes are able to manage our lands with a balanced approach because we live with the benefits and consequences of our actions. For tribal people, environmental preservation is cultural preservation. Tribes operate modern, innovative, comprehensive natural resource programs premised on connectedness to the land, the resources, and the people. Our approach is holistic, striving to simultaneously sustain economic, ecological, and cultural values, the so-called triple bottom line. The active management tribes employ to realize the triple bottom line is facilitated by three elements. Our forests are held in trust for the use and benefit of our tribes and their members, and are guided by management direction from our tribal governments in a manner consistent with the federal government's trust responsibility. The federal law guiding BIA and tribal management of these forests, the National Indian Forest Resource Management Act of 1990, is the most recent and most flexible federal forest management statute. And the Indian Self-Determination Act has empowered tribes to assume direct and comprehensive control over the management of our forests. The challenge before tribes today is balancing natural resource management actions that reflect the social, cultural, economic, and natural resource values of the tribal people in the face of a changing climate and disturbance regimes. To maintain tribal cultures, the tribal membership must have access to the places and resources that define that culture. This is why Indian forests are one of the greatest resources tribes have. Balancing those interests is not simple, but tribes are successfully doing so by recognizing and respecting the natural processes, both spatially and through time. Accomplishment of forest management goals is not optional for us. In addition to the cultural and environmental benefits, forest management activities provide jobs to local communities and revenue to support tribal services. My tribal leadership at Cawville relies on these funds to pay for the basic needs of our tribal people, such as education, law enforcement, and employment economic opportunity and employment and access to basic human services on the reservation are critical for tribes. Without these things, we will continue to see our people move away from our homelands, making it even harder to maintain those spiritual and cultural connections. Unlike the U.S. Forest Service and BLM forests, Indian forests and their management are reviewed by an independent scientific panel every 10 years. In 2013, the Indian Forest Management Assessment Team released its third report to Congress since 1994. The 2013 IFMAT report shows the tribes are suffering from chronic underfunding and challenges created by the loss of leadership and staffing. Yet it also shows significant progress is being made on tribal forests. One of the key report findings is that tribes are able to accomplish more in their forests with far less funding than other federal land managers. On a per acre basis, tribes receive about one third the funding for forest and wildfire management compared to the Forest Service. Despite our best efforts to protect our resources, wildfire poses an increasing risk to our values. 
The current model has been unsuccessful and the only way to turn the tide is to invest in staffing and accomplishments at a pace and scale that restore natural processes. This is clearly a huge task, but a fight tribes must win to preserve the small remnants of their traditional territory that exist as reservations today. As I stated above, without environmental preservation, tribes will struggle with cultural preservation. Even when we do everything right, fires from adjacent federal lands continue to threaten tribal forests. The ITC appreciates congressional or congressional authorities, such as the Tribal Forest Protection Act and Good Neighbor Authority that allow tribes to do restoration work on nearby federal lands, where many tribes also exercise treaty hunting, fishing, and gathering rights. In the age of fire, I see forest management as a tool of conservation and protection. It might be our most important tool. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dressertill, and for all the witnesses for showing us the linkage between cultural preservation and environmental preservation. Um, I'm going to remind the members that Committee Rule 3D imposes a five minute limit on questions. The chair will now recognize members for any questions they may wish to ask the witnesses. I will begin by recognizing myself. Chairman Fairbanks, the White Earth Nation formally passed a law to recognize the rights of the Mano Omen or the rights of nature to include a quote, right to clean water and fresh water habitat, end quote. If the federal or state governments had acknowledged the application of tribal law to protect the Mano Omen, and my apologies if I didn't say it correct, uh, pronounce it correctly, but if uh, federal state governments had acknowledged the application of tribal law, what would have been the outcome of the Line 3 pipeline and why? So, Madam Chairwoman, I guess uh, what, what I want to say is like, you know, uh, our monomen is very, very uh, uh, spiritual to us. This is this is uh, the prophecies, our, our history of our people that, that brought us to these lands where the food does grow on the water. And I know with, uh, with this pipeline and you know, and I guess I'll refer back to some of our prophecies as the black snake that came through our territory. You know, it it it, it kind of pollutes what, what we have today. You know, a, a good example of this is is that a few years ago we harvested over 160,000 pounds of green wild rice. That When I say green wild rice, that is the, the rice that hasn't been finished yet. And uh, this year, 2021, we harvested almost 10,000 pounds. So that just gives you a, a good example of what, what, but not only the, you know, the the water shortage and the drought that has Minnesota, but also what this pipeline has brought through with these water water permits, because it crosses multiple multiple um, waters. It crosses underneath the Mississippi, the headwaters over by Lake LaSalle. We had a, they had a camp over there that had uh, they had a uh, 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 the the fracking that went on, the fracking material that came up when they were when they were drilling that hole underneath the, the Mississippi River over there at the headwaters, that a lot of that fracking uh, substance bubbled up to the top while they were, while they were even, they were even, uh, they were protesting over there that it bubbled up and a lot of our, our membership was was just outraged by this, you know, and and, uh, and we do have rice beds over by the Mississippi over there. So, I mean, it, it, it just it just tells you right there in a, in a short synopsis that, that this has affected us. You know, I know this, it, it doesn't show us, but, you know, and, and like I said in my testimony earlier, I know that uh, even up by Clearbrook, which is north of us, north of off our reservation, but still in our seated areas, that they ruptured a, 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 a artesian aquifer that that wouldn't quit. They, they were trying to plug it for for weeks and they couldn't plug it up. And, that, and that's when I, when I mentioned in my testimony that the state of Minnesota only fined them $3 million for that. And they, they did that for a long time without even reporting the, the rupture of that aquifer, thank you. That aquifer up there. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Chairman Fairbanks, for pointing out those impacts on uh, your water as well as your wild rice harvest from um, the pipeline uh, and the fracking. Um, I'd like to now turn and ask Mr. Meroto, your testimony also described how your tribe views natural resources not as something to be simply exploited, but as uh, relatives you use uh, who something to be protected. Um, what federal policy changes do you believe would help you and your work? So um, what, what policy changes do you think would help you uh, in your work and also would fulfill our federal trust responsibility to the tribes 
and to those resources to the relatives which must be protected? Well, well, thank you for that question. And uh... is that is that question for me? Just a second. Yes, I intended that that question would be for Mr. Morato. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, I, you know, I, I hope I explained, you know, the, the, the great importance of the relatives to the Red Cliff tribe. Um, and, you know, we have uh, obligations and, um, you know, we need to look out for uh, the water, the land, um, and all these natural resources. So, you know, all these policies that, you know, get put in place that help protect like things like the Clean, uh, Clean Water Act, um, you know, anything that deals with, you know, pollution to the air, pollution to the environment. Um, those are definitely things that, you know, we uh, hold in high regard and, you know, need to be mindful of. Um, you know, we have, or I, we believe that, you know, the, the federal government has the, the trust responsibility um, to preserve the native lifeways and specifically the trust and treaty responsibilities. Um, and, you know, the treaty rights are one of the most important rights that the uh, Red Cliff Tribe sees here. Um, we're a small reservation, but we have to uh, provide a way of life for, for our membership here. And that is definitely one of the ways that uh, we do so. Thank you very much for that question. I would love to, and I, I would hope that uh, uh, Ms. Azuz and Mr. Desitel will uh, share additional information on federal policies we may provide that would enhance the use of fire uh, and the protections of the forest. The chair will now recognize for, quest uh, for his questions, uh, Representative Young, the ranking member. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Desnell. Um, you know, you mentioned in your testimony the Tribal Forest Protection Act and expanded good neighbor authority. The question is, is the good neighbor authority working well in its current form are there ways that we can improve upon it? The Good Neighbor Authority that was expanded in 2018 Farm Bill is not yet. So while the authority was expanded to tribes and counties to enter into agreements, the legislation did not include an expansion of the authorization to spend program revenue. So states are being successful by utilizing revenue generated from those natural resource projects to fund future work, that authority doesn't exist for tribes and counties. So it would take tribal investment of tribal dollars to enter into those agreements through good neighbor. So for the most part, tribes have tried to utilize the Tribal Forest Protection Act where we can enter into 638 contracts to conduct that work. So do you think we need language? That's what the Forest Service tells us. We've worked on that for a couple of years. Well, really since the passing of the farm bill, but the way they've interpreted that is that can you including provide that necessary language so we can do it. I'm not, I'm not happy with the force service right now. I want you to know that because they do not manage force. They become a park agency. They don't look at civil culture as a viable course. And, and I think that's a terrible disservice to everybody. So whatever I can do, you let us know the chairman and ourselves and see if we can not improve upon that. Okay, second question. Um, what are some lessons from the native people that you think could be implemented in the management of federal forest lands? I think this is important because we might put it in the farm bill. Yeah, thank you. Um, something that we've done across Indian country is utilized fire, both prescribed fire and managed wildfire. And that's something that doesn't really happen on federal lands with the exception of wilderness areas. And those is, that isn't really management of fire, they just a let burn policy. So I think tribes have done a good job across the country at managing forests to make them resilient to fire, recognizing that that's a natural part of that ecosystem. So if you have those balances on the landscape, you can have wildfire even in a changing climate and the post-fire impacts aren't as bad as what you see on unmanaged federal land. So I think there, there's a recognition in Indian country that fire adapted ecosystems should have fire and will have fire. And how do we accommodate, how do we take care of those responsibilities as Indian people to care for the resources that are important to us by managing them through time and recognizing that it's active management is something that you have to continually do, that it's not a snapshot in time, you do it once and you're done. So I, I think those are approaches tribes take that are unique when compared to most other federal agencies. 
Okay, last question. In your testimony, you mentioned a need for additional staffing and resources to address the threat of wildfire. Oh, that's good, but what? how do you expect to spend? Would you spend it or the Forest Service? Forest Service is not using that many as they should. They wait till after the fact. So how do we do that? So as I stated in the testimony, if looking at the last IFMAT report, IFMAT 3, tribes get about one third the funding on a per acre basis that the Forest Service get. So yet if you look at our accomplishments, they're substantially higher on a per acre basis compared to the Forest Service land management responsibility. So if we have additional funding that not only allows tribes to accomplish their management goals on reservation, it builds capacity within the tribes to do that work off reservation and in traditional territories and ceded territories, utilizing good neighbor authority, Tribal Forest Protection Act, and other mechanisms Congress has granted both the Forest Service and tribes to accomplish that work. Uh, I appreciate that. And, and you know, uh, this is where people like myself get in trouble. I've always said Smokey was the worst thing ever happened to our Forest Service. Uh, they don't utilize fires for control or, or management of it. And uh, it is part of the system. And uh, now we have these terrible fires. The volatility of on some of our acres in our national forest is 100 barrels of gasoline per acre. Uh, and because we haven't managed it. And I, I've been fighting with them over years. I don't have that problem in Alaska with my forest fires yet. Uh, but I've watched California and I've watched the Western states and we've lost billions of dollars in timber resources because of lack of management by the Forest Service. So I thank my witnesses. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna go about my business with another meeting and I do appreciate everything you guys are doing. Let's get sleep against all these problems. God bless. Thank you very much, Ranking Member Young. The Chair will now recognize the Chair of the Committee, uh, Chairman Grijalba, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for, for the witnesses and, 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 and the very important topic. When we talk about uh, Indian country and, and indigenous people and the trust responsibility, tribes, uh, I think there's a lot of areas not only the, the resource capacity area, but the, 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 the codification of what we're talking about today and other topics that you brought up, Madam Chair, as well. Um, everything from the, the STOP Act to the RESPECT Act in terms of consultation. And, uh, uh, but what I want to concentrate on right now is uh, the, the point that you're making here today. And, and, and let me ask, uh, 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 Chairman Fair, Fairbanks, uh, a question. You, you know, you highlight White Earth Nations attempt to express concerns about the pipeline's threats to important cultural sites in the routing and permitting process. However, that permit was approved without compliance to the issues or without tribal consultation. The importance, sir, what is the importance of tribal consultation in preserving and protecting tribal sacred sites? and essential natural resources, uh, cultural resources. What's the role? Thank you, Thank you Chairman. A, me a meaningful prior to informed tribal consultation is critical when, it, when the, the federal government takes actions that impacts the tribal lands and treaty territories, specifically the Army Corps of Engineers has been an in-depth tribal consultation protocol that they did not follow approving the permit of line three. Replacing project hiding behind COVID-19 pandemic to rush through the, because of the federal government continues to owe the trust response to tribal governments and consultation is the only way to ensure that the federal government fulfills the obligation to tribes. I know here back in Minnesota, you know, Governor Waltz, he does have a, 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 a law or a, um, 19, Executive Order 1924 that allows all, with all those commissioners that we do have consultation with anything. But that's one thing that when I expressed earlier that the DNR commissioner kind of okay. kind of didn't, didn't let us know about the, the 5 billion gallon, you know, water permit okay. that they gave Enbridge. So thank you. I mean, there's, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Marota. Uh, your opinion, the issue of cultural preservation that you brought up uh, that is tied to tied in, 
intimately to what we're talking to, to your presentation. Uh, how back to that trust and treaty obligations to tribal governments from by the U.S. government. How does that how does that cultural preservation fit into that trust and treaty obligations? Mr. Maroder? Sure. Uh, the federal government's trust uh, responsibility and its treaty obligations, uh, you know, include responsibility to preserve the native lifeways. Is there a clock so I can see where I'm at? Okay. Um, you know, I, I hope that I explained the importance of, you know, the natural resources uh, to you all today. Um, you know, the natural resources really represent a way of life for the people here in Red Cliff. Um, you know, many of our members rely upon uh, these rights to feed their families. You know, we, we get food from the grocery store that we don't get, um, you know, from the environment and, you know, in our hunting and our gathering and our fishing. Um, you know, we see Lake Superior uh, as a garden, uh, you know, something that we restock year round to provide uh, subsistence for our membership in the community. Um, and, you know, by adequately funding our, our natural resources program, uh, this culture and way of life will be able to be continue and preserved for generations to come. Thank you for this. And, and as Madam Chair, before I yield back, uh, let me thank you. Uh, I. I really believe that the discussions that we've been having and uh, Mr. Young included about how to codify some of the more important things we're talking about, uh, how to fix uh, resource allocation and authority uh, within existing laws uh, are all a part of this discussion. And so I look forward to uh, the work of the committee and, and look forward to moving some of these as quickly as possible, particularly now with we seem to be coming to an end on the reconciliation budget process and the infrastructure. Uh, I think then it's time to for, for as you mentioned, Madam Chair, to focus on uh, codification and uh, and fixing uh, what's already there. So thank you for this, and uh, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Chairman Grijalva. I do look forward to working with you and our ranking member to address these issues. Uh, the chair will now recognize uh, Representative Benz, uh, uh, our gentleman from Oregon, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I am. I, I think my question is going to be addressed to uh, Mr. Salto. I hope I haven't mispronounced your name. But uh, I'll just say, Cody. Cody, uh, here's the here's the questions. Uh, many of the tribes in 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 my uh, district uh, uh, are surrounded by forests, and I think would uh, would do a great job uh, helping us gain access to them. And and part of the problem we've had, as as everybody knows, and I think this may be the impatience we heard reflected by ranking member young and with the forest service is that it's just it's just almost impossible to to do anything in our forests so my first question has to do with capacity and in some of the conversations i've had with with tribes in my district that the, there has been a great willingness to to do stuff but they've all said hey we don't we don't enjoy the capacity and you can fit anything in that space you want whether it's running a sawmill whether it's doing the analysis whether it's doing the paperwork whether it's doing all the things necessary to move from where we are, uh, kind of a we'd like to, to actually doing stuff. So uh, tell me if you would, am, am I correct? Is this capacity problem normal, uh, abnormal? Is it something that we should be concerned about? No, it's absolutely normal and it is something we're concerned about. Uh, most tribes have fairly small staffs based on the amount of funding they receive from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, like I said, my testimony, that's one third on a per acre basis compared to the Forest Service. And because of the challenges and the rural nature of most reservations, it's difficult to get tribal members to come back home, especially after they go out and get education. So from a capacity standpoint, it is a little limiting. Um, and that's particularly true because the BI funding that most tribes receive is specific for the management of trust acres. So it's not really eligible to spend on forest service land or BLM land. So without some funding source to take advantage of the capacity where it exists in Indian country, you don't have to have a funding stream outside of spending tribal dollars to accomplish those same tasks. 
And it's, it's a tough sell to go to a tribal council and tell them you want to spend the limited tribal dollars that the government generates for services for its tribal people and spend those dollars on Forest Service ground next door, understanding how much the Forest Service already gets to manage those acres. So it's a challenge for sure. Oh, that is the understatement of the century. Let me just uh, continue a with a follow-up question. I, I've been meeting with uh, various uh, timber companies and tribes, everybody, uh, in regard to the current condition of our forests, which everyone, there is uniform agreement, uh, at least uh, not necessarily in Alaska, but certainly here on the, in the Western United States, that uh, there has been at least 40 years, perhaps longer of, uh, one might want to call it benign neglect, but I think it's been intentional neglect of, of, of uh, activities within our forests. And the result has been uh, the creation of a circumstance. We heard of uh, how many barrels of gasoline, uh, the, the equivalents per acre, and that is certainly the truth, and we've all seen pictures of it in California and elsewhere. It's just, it's, it's frightening. Uh, one, of the, one of my conversations very recently led, led to uh, this, this conclusion, and, and the conclusion is this. If you don't go in and remove in some way some of the uh, overgrowth and incredible buildup of fuel without the use of fire, uh, and then should you decide to use fire, uh, without doing it, you will lose the forest. It's just that it's grown so. It's got there's so much fuel. This this this. Uh, people seem to just defer to. Well, you know, we we can go ahead and use prescribed burns, and and you know, and, and the truth of it is, I think we've passed that point. I honest to goodness think in many many places where we have two three hundred trees per acre when we should have forty, uh, we can't use prescribed burns. Do you think that tribes uh, are a way of getting us into the forest in a way other than just prescribed burns. And I ask that for the obvious reasons, because I always hear about that being the solution that the tribes might bring into play. And I'm just saying, I think we're past that point. So do you think, is it possible that we could anticipate not burning and yet having tribes help out? Yes, I, I think tribes understand burning much better than most people. They understand what forest conditions are conducive to burning. So if you've got an overstock stand that has the wrong structure and the wrong species composition, prescribed fire will not accomplish your goals. There needs to be something done ahead of time to return that landscape back to a more historical condition where fire can be used. And I think tribes can help demonstrate that on their reservations and speak to the federal land management agencies about what they would do in advance to make prescribed fire a potential tool on that landscape. And thank you so much for that. I'm sure I yield back. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, the chair will now recognize uh, Representative Gallego, the chair gentleman from Arizona. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, Mr. Azus, like you, I'm from a state where wildfire is a huge environmental and health risk to our communities, including especially indigenous communities. Can you expand on the environmental and ecological benefit of your tribe's cultural practices? Has cultural burning helped you to prevent dangerous fires and adverse health impacts? Thank you, sir. Um, yes, actually, we have had great uh, success with our prescribed burns. And we do go in and pre-treat areas. Um, there are areas that are too dense. They've been over uh, planted so that they could create these. Um, <laughs> I hate to say this, but they create these huge areas for financing other uh, objectives. You know, for us, we go in, we clear the area, we bring down a few of the trees depending on their size. Uh, there are pile burns that happen. There are a lot of levels of using fire to restore the land. You know, for us, fire is family. So we work with family. We teach our young people how to do this, how to bring all of this uh, fuel out of an area that could possibly destroy even a carbon credit project or a forest service project. Um, the most difficult piece to this is having the government agencies listen to us because they don't believe that we have the skill necessary, that we don't have the years of training that they have. And so, you know, convincing them to work with us is the hardest piece. But if you were able to get on the land, put your feet on the land, work with the people, work with the communities, it's amazing what you can make happen. Um, 
bringing people from all over the country and all over the world to learn how to do this has been helping many of the indigenous tribes around the world to restore their environment. So, you know, this is something that I can't stress enough. We need to do this now. We all need to do this. We need to have the resources. We need to be able to train people to do this. And our environmental impacts have been amazing for our area because we're able to reproduce our foods, our medicines, uh, our animals are thriving, our community is thriving, our elders are protected, their homes, our schools. All of these things are done because we put people on the ground that care about the environment and care about their people. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Zeus. Uh, second question, the state of California, as well as the conservation community more broadly, has a history of mistrust of indigenous people's practices of cultural burning. I personally have long believed we must look to indigenous peoples, the original stewards of this land, to inform federal land management. Since your, since your organization was established, what has worked to change old ways of thinking about indigenous land management, and what ways can the federal government better learn from your tribe's cultural burning? Uh, recently, we've started burning with the Park Service. They've reached out to us and asked us to come into the parks and to help them to restore the redwoods, to help them to restore the prairies and the meadows. Um, we burn for natural resources. We burn to protect our environment. Most agencies uh, burn to protect their resources, to protect the finances they're able to bring in from the tourists who visit our beautiful area. You know, we don't look at it as a monetary uh, issue. We look at it as restoration of our families, of our environments. You know, the one-legged tree people, as we call them, they're family. Everything that lives in these forests are family. They're not just food. You know, they're part of who we are as human beings. And so with working with these agencies and being able to have a conversation with them and show them what we're capable of, has really opened up the eyes of many of these agencies. Uh, we actually have a really decent relationship with the Forest Service in this area, simply because we have a lot of natives in their um, organization. And they understand what we do as indigenous people. So we're a little further along here in California uh, based on that. But I think the rest of the country is way behind because, you know, I don't know how many people actually walk out into the environment and see the trees and see the um, foods on the land. They have no idea that you can find food other than a supermarket. Mm -hmm. So, you know, thank you so much for that question. And I look forward to any other. Thank you, uh, Ms. Azusa. That was actually very informative. Uh, I will be running out of time, so I will yield back my time to the chairwoman. Thank you. Um, the chair will now recognize uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. S Representative Soto. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Recently, the Pandora Papers have illuminated incredible cultural theft that's happened over the last few hundred years. Everything from artifacts stolen from the Khmer Empire in Cambodia to a recent Washington Post article this morning about West African artifacts looted, 26 highly valued uh, artifacts that are now heading back to Benin. We face similar challenges protecting Native American artifacts and culture here at home. In Southwest Florida, for instance, in the city of Northport, a known for archeological sites within its city limits and home to the warm mineral spring site, we had Native Americans arrive there 12 to 15,000 years ago during the Pleistocene period. These areas were inhabited during the ice ages uh, when mammoths and giant mammals roamed our state. It's illegal to dig up and buy or sell human artifacts from Native Americans and on federal land. But as recently as 2019, we saw looters collecting I, uh, items from the Mayakahatchee Creek in Southwest Florida. Not only are these artifacts at risk, both in our nation and across the world, but also Native Americans' way of life, religious ceremonies, hunting, agriculture, and land management has been previously discussed. So my question uh, is first uh, to uh, Chairman Fairbanks, what can we do in both preservation and management and civil and criminal penalties to protect Native American artifacts and other ways of life? 
Thank you. Thank you for that question. You know, I, I guess where, where, where I, how I look at it is like preserving and, and us as being the stewards of the land is like, you know, is the, is the communication between, you know, our, our protectors, which, which I, when I say protectors is our, is our Congress, our, our state representatives, you know, that, that consultation, I think, is the most important part about communicating from both parties that, we're, that we want to protect what we have for our future generations. And that's one thing I, I tell my constituents here and also our tribal membership is that we have to, we have to protect what we have left because, you know, we did, a, we did a study here about the water in Minnesota where we have, and this is probably about three to four years old now, is 54% of the water is undrinkable right now across Minnesota. So there's some standards that are kind of really kind of out there right now. And I'm not sure all, all the other states, and, and this is just coming from Minnesota, the, the land of 10,000 lakes, you know. So so we do have some type of, uh, you know, the, 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 there's poisons out there that are affecting everything across our, our nations. And, you know, then having this pipeline come across is something that we have to, you know, it's something that we have to be more, more, uh, uh, communicated to about even in the design of it or whatever is to make sure make sure that that communication and that safety and that all, everything is, is, is there for us to, to talk about it and you know I know that we, we as a country and yourself congressman is that you know we're looking to the future and looking at renewable energy and we're looking at different methods of other than fossil fuels to burn and just like the other the council members that are online is that you know we don't want to put too much up in the air because we're already burning up as it is. So, but I want to say thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Fairbanks. Chairman Boyd, what do you believe are ways we could uh, both preserve uh, and help with land management and civil and criminal penalties to protect Native American artifacts and, and ways of life? Cool. Chairman Boyd. Uh, there are presently having a fire drill for Chairman okay. Boyd, so uh, we'll, we'll have to maybe move on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Then we'll turn next to Secretary Azuz uh, for the same question. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. I completely <laughs> was okay. listening. What, to Secretary Azuz, what can we do both in preservation, land management, and civil and criminal penalties to protect Native American artifacts and ways of life? Oh my gosh, you know, um, I would say the verbiage in most of these policies don't include Native Americans, um, Indigenous peoples. And coming, you know, from government agencies, that makes it difficult for us as Indigenous people to believe that we're going to be protected, that our resources are important to other people, that our cultural artifacts belong here with us. You know, we have... Um, recently reacquired some of our baskets and regalia from the Smithsonian for the Yurok tribe. And being the largest tribe in California, we were honored to receive these things back, but also realizing that they had been protected um, in these museums with chemicals that make them no longer usable for us as human beings. You know, there are so many policies in place that hinder our way of life. And if there was some way for the verbiage to be changed to include the indigenous people, that would be a great beginning. Thank you. Thank sir. you, my time's expired. Thank you very much, Representative Soto. I would also note that in line with your questioning, the Save uh, Tribal Objects of Patrimony, the STOP Act, which Chairman Grijalva also referenced, has been passed out of uh, the Natural Resources Committee, and we are hopeful that it will soon get a hearing on the floor of the House. Um, so the chair will now recognize uh, the gentleman from Hawaii, uh, Representative Case. Madam Chair and colleagues and our witnesses, thank you so much for holding this important hearing to highlight cultural and language preservation as foundational to the perpetuation and prosperity of our indigenous peoples. This is just as true for the indigenous peoples of our country whose origins lie in Hawaii, the native Hawaiians, as it is for any other indigenous peoples. And as they are regrettably not represented among our witnesses today, I wish to add their perspective given in, my, in the time available to me. Uh, for over a century now, our federal government has consistently recognized a special political and trust relationship with Native Hawaiians, in part through the enactment of 150 plus federal statutes. I am grateful to Congress and this committee in particular for your support over the years, whether appropriations, COVID-19 relief efforts and other legislative action, 
uh, to create and advance Native Hawaiian serving programs. As to the critical topics of this hearing, first, to language. For Native Hawaiians, as for other Indigenous peoples, language is more than just a method of communication. It is integral, integral preserving and perpetuating the customs, traditions, and values of the community. The Hawaiian language itself was once on the brink of extinction, yet today has become a model for revitalizing Indigenous languages around the world. With the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom in 1893 and annexation of Hawaii in 1898, use of the Hawaiian language was significantly reduced and at times, in many places, outright banned from government and in schools. It was not until our 1978 State Constitutional Convention that the Hawaiian language was made an official state language, making us the only state with two official languages. The decision helped open doors for generations now of students to learn the Hawaiian language through our public schools. But the revitalization of the Hawaiian language was also attributable to the collective efforts of many, like Dr. Larry Kimura, who founded the Hawaiian language radio talk show Kaleo Hawaii in the 1970s and 80s, and co-founded Aha Punana Leo, an organization which first helped to reestablish Native Hawaiian medium education. Today, it is now possible to receive an education entirely taught in the Hawaiian language, from preschool right through a doctoral program. And that is because of the work pioneered by Aha Punanaleo and others. Madam Chair, a few months ago, you honored Congressman Kahele and, I, and me in visiting my hometown of Hilo, Hawaii, to understand uh, Native Hawaiians, including visiting with Aha Punanaleo the longest standing indigenous language medium nest program in the United States and a shining example to this committee and all indigenous peoples of what is possible uh, in the preservation of language and culture. In terms of environmental preservation, we also cannot preserve culture without also conserving and protecting our precious natural resources. Like American Indians and Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians similarly and yet uniquely view the land or aina and the ocean or kai as sacred, a source of nourishment while also, which, while also foundational to their culture and identity. For Native Hawaiians who are part of the original canoe peoples of Oceania, the health of the environment is tied directly to the health of our communities. Madam Chair, I would like to submit for the record a number of, uh, of, 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 of uh, materials that bear upon uh, the importance of the preservation in, of language uh, as well as uh, our unique environmental resources uh, to um, uh, the, Latin, the culture and, and history of our indigenous peoples, uh, including um, a statement uh, from um, Aha Punanaleo about the role they play in educating thousands of students uh, in Hawaii, um, as well as uh, written testimony from Kevin Chang, the executive director of Hua Aina Ulu Awamoa, or Hua, a Native Hawaiian organization that works with local communities government agencies, schools, businesses, and others to advance community-based solutions to protecting, restoring, and caring for Hawaii's unique native species, ecosystems, and ways of life. In addition, I'd like to submit for the record written testimony from Kavika Winter, Winter, PhD, who is the reserve manager of Heia National Estuary and Research Reserve, a collaborative management agreement between NOAA, the state of Hawaii, and Native Hawaiian organizations that are involved in stewardship and cultural revitalization, all of which support indigenous resource management. I also submit for the record relevant testimonies from the Office of Hawaiian Affairs to the US Senate Committee on Indian Affairs dated September 13th, 2019 and December 21st, 2020, and to this subcommittee dated March 23rd, 2021. I appreciate greatly uh, this subcommittee's continued attention on Native Hawaiians as well as other indigenous peoples and on the particular relevance of language uh, and culture and environmental pr preservation to the perpetuation of our indigenous peoples. Thank you and I yield back. Uh, the, thank you so very much, Representative Case, for uh, submitting uh, those pieces of evidence into the record so that we may have a fuller uh, presentation of the many ways in which Native Hawaiians, uh, similar, uh, although unique, because of their long, their huge land um, ocean base, uh, provide to uh, protecting, protecting uh, the environment. 
Uh, I would also like to note and welcome back uh, Redcliffe to the hearing. Um, the chair will now recognize uh, Representative Garcia, uh, the gentleman from the state of Illinois. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, Ranking Member, and of course, uh, the witnesses uh, joining us today. We've all seen the disproportionate impact that this pandemic has had on indigenous communities across the country. But one thing that hasn't gotten as much attention is the cultural crisis that these communities face. The loss of tribal leaders as a result of COVID-19 endangers indigenous languages, knowledge, and culture, and uh, all of which is uh, the deadly toll of a chore change health system and generations of violence and broken promises by our government. I'm encouraged to see the tribal governments and organizations here today leading movements dedicated to cultural preservation. But the bottom line is that our government is responsible for providing for the cultural and physical well-being of tribal communities to ensure their survival. Uh, for a question for Mr. Chase uh, Miroto, um, in your testimony, you described the mission of Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, and now uh, the fishing company is not just a business, but a way to strengthen the community's historical subsistence practices. In your experience, how has the Red Cliff Fish Company contributed to community food sovereignty? And to what extent are tribal members and fishers active in this movement? Absolutely, thank you for your question. Um, I think as, as I've stated before, uh, fishing here is, is a way of life for, for many of the families here in Redcliffe. Um, and it's not just the fishermen, uh, but a lot of other community members also uh, rely on those activities for, you know, for jobs, uh, for food for their families, uh, for food for the elders, for food for, um, you know, our, our growing youth. Um, so a lot of different people um, you know, engage in these activities. Um, and again, it is just, it is vital to the way of life here. Um, it has been that way for generation for generation, um, you know, just passing down that, that knowledge and that history from, you know, from grandpas and grandpas and to uh, sons and daughters and to, to children all over. Um, so the, you know, the food sovereignty too is, you know, food for people, um, by the community, um, the community here has really embraced the, the fish company. Um, you know, we have done, you know, different collaborations with different tribal programs here uh, in order to get, you know, a, a healthy, sustainable protein um, in the hands of, of our community around the, around the area, not just, you know, on, on the reservation, but, you know, in the surrounding areas as well. Um, so it's just, you know, it is a, it is a great importance. Um, and it's a, it's a really big step forward into that food sovereignty and being able to provide uh, that type of food for, uh, like I said, for the community and the surrounding area. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, my uh, last question is, what role uh, do you see the federal government playing in the preservation of the tribal community's culture? Yeah, uh, you know, we, our natural resources program uh, depends on the funding from the federal government. Um, and we've enacted, you know, multiple programs and, you know, we've expanded our, our tribal program. Uh, when I first, you know, started here 10 years ago, we had maybe 15 employees. We've almost doubled that. Um, so, you know, continuing to be able to provide uh, those services, uh, it costs money for us. And we need to make sure that we can, uh, you know, be, um effective in you know reaching out to the qualified individuals uh we do have tribal members that go off and i know it was it was mentioned before here you know retaining some of those members to uh come back to the community uh after they've been educated um so we have to make sure that we can provide uh competitive jobs um you know in this area it's 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 a a remote area and making sure that we can get the most qualified individuals here um, is of great importance as well. Great. And what role, especially, do you want uh, government to be there for you? 
Yeah, uh, I would say that, um, you know, continue to support our, our BIA uh, 638 contracts um, and, you know, again, providing that that uh, um, that those funding sources for us um, and also making sure that, um, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, different policies that would be enacted to make sure that we are, uh, you know, protecting those natural resources and the relatives of Red Cliff and making sure that, you know, we're not harming them. Um, and they're going to be there for future generations to come. You know, one of the mindsets here is, you know, protecting those uh, those natural resources for the next seven generations and beyond and making sure that we are able to do so, um, I think is of great importance. Th thank you so much. And with that, uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you for your indulgence. Thank you so very much. And the chair will now recognize my sister from the state of New Mexico, Representative Stansbury, for five minutes. Good morning and thank you Chairwoman Ledger Fernandez. It's wonderful to be with you all today and I want to thank you all for joining us and sharing your thoughts and your work on how you are working to protect our sacred air, lands and waters. As we all know, our indigenous communities have lived on these lands and in New Mexico in our home state since time immemorial and have managed the lands and waters using practices that have been passed down for generations. In fact, many of the agricultural practices, foods and water systems that all of our communities depend on today stretch back over those generations of stewardship by our Pueblo and tribal communities. These communities have always known that our lands and our waters are sacred and have fought to protect them as stewards of these places. Tribes and Pueblos continue to be at the forefront of land and water management and stewardship in New Mexico today, including the management of water, wildlife, our forests, and fire management. Pueblos in the middle of Rio Grande, including Pueblos like Sandia, Isleta, and Santa Ana, have been working to restore our bosque and ensuring that water is available for generations to come. And Pueblos such as Kiwa, Cochiri, Jemez, and Santa Clara have been working to restore the forest, manage for fire, and improve the soils and waters of the land. And tribes and pueblos all across our state are working to address the impacts of climate change and plan for a more resilient future to maintain and revitalize traditional practices, cultures, and languages, restore and repatriate sacred and traditional lands, and con continue those traditional stewardship practices that are so crucial to the cultures and traditions and ways of life of our communities. Our indigenous communities manage the land and water this way because they know it is intrinsically sacred, it is vital to cultural preservation, and it is core to the well being of our communities and future generations. So, as we've heard here today, and as the testimony has highlighted, there is such an important need to lift up indigenous resource management and support the development of future generations in this work. And as a partner, I believe that the US government has a fundamental responsibility to acknowledge its past and right the wrongs of the past and acknowledge and honor tribal sovereignty in this work. And in doing so, it's really crucial that our federal agencies and federal government honor its trust and treaty responsibilities, support indigenous led resource management, repatriate sacred and traditional lands to our tribes and pueblos, uh, engage in meaningful consultation, provide adequate funding and support for tribal resource management agencies, honor our sacred and traditional uses on federal lands, support co-management where appropriate, help to build that pipeline for the future, and in a word, to re-indigenize federal land management itself. And so I want to thank our witnesses and the chairwoman for holding this important hearing. And I'd love to ask our panelists, Mr. Fairbanks and others who may like to respond to this. What do you think that the federal government can do to help support tribal sovereignty and promote traditional stewardship and management and help to build that next generation and pipeline of indigenous resource managers? Miigwech and thank you, Congresswoman. You know, you know that, that's a good question. You know, and you know, back home here, we got one third of our our nation is is prairie and farm, and then two thirds of it is forest. And you know, we do have one federal forest that um, agency that's on the on the southeast of our reservation called the Tamarack Refuge. And you know, as a tribe, you know, you know, 
we are the stewards of, of our lands, and, and that's one thing that we've been pursuing. And I, I know talking and listening to, to Congressman, Congressman Young was talking about the U.S. Forest Service, and, and that's one thing that we, we we're trying right now to, to co-manage our forests with, with these agencies. So, because we've been doing this for, for, for a long time, and a, a lot of the indigenous trees that we want back home here, you know, we, we, we're, we're requesting that, that they be replanted, like some of our cedars that are very, very sacred to us. You know, they're, they're used in so many of our, of our sacred uh, uh, ceremonies, like our sweat lodge, our, our cedar our ceremonies, you know, a lot of this. So we're, we're connected. And that, those are just a little examples of, of the connection to, to our trees that we have. And, uh, you know, and, and, and management is something that we, we, we'd love to do. We have a great forest program here, a forestry program. You know, I know our, our, our departments and our, our young men that work, and women that work over there really do a lot of work for us with, even like we talked earlier about when I was listening to some of the other tribes is uh, some of the prescribed burns, because we do have a lot of prairie on the, the west end of our, of our reservation that we're, so it's like it's it's something that I think we we can work collaboratively if, if the communication. That's what I stressed again is communication with our not only our agencies but also with our with our our Congress and also with our our senators that we that we communicate and we have those those meaningful consultations. That's the that's the that's the main part and that's one of the things I stressed earlier about about line three is we were never had meaningful consultation with the Army Corps of Engineers. So I think that's one aspect that we could look at to to uh, to help preserve what we have left and and to make sure that that, that our, our federal government protects us and protects our homeland so thank you and, and thank you miigwech thank you mr fairbanks and madam chair i see we're out of time but i'll be submitting a question for the record so that we can hear from all of our witnesses and just really appreciate you for convening this hearing today thank you thank you right. thank you very much to our witnesses for bringing both your insightful uh, testimony and answering the questions and giving us ideas and a, uh, suggestions on a path forward to strengthen the relationship, to strengthen the con uh, consultation uh, between the federal agencies and the tribes. Uh, as I stated before, the members of the committee may have additional questions for the witnesses, uh, and we will ask you to respond to these in writing. Under committee rule 30, members of 30, members of the committee must submit written questions within three business days following the hearing, and the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for responses. Uh, if there is no further business, without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned.